Hello and welcome to the Moravian Music Foundation and Archives, Moravian Archives, for the Lunchtime Lecture Series. I'm Eric Saltzvedel. I'm the business manager for the Moravian Music Foundation. And we're happy to have with us today Dr. Ronna, Donna Rothrock. Um, she's the associate librarian and assistant professor of music education at Salem College. Um, she handles the music library over here in the Salem Fine Arts Center. That's her. That's your purview, I guess. Um, she teaches music education courses. She's band director at Trinity Moravian Church. Um, she founded and conducts the Salem Trombone Choir. She's a lifelong Moravian, a member of Trinity Moravian. I think um, uh, my ancestors and her ancestors came to the Friedberg area about the same time, the Teshes and the Rothrocks. So without further ado, Dr. Donna Rothrock. Thank you. It's been a while since I've been up here in front of you. Uh, I guess several years anyway. And please forgive us, we're using the poor man's clicker today, so I signal David and he flips the button since we can't get the, the thing to advance. But that's okay. Okay, the title of my presentation is Music in Salem During the Civil War. Was it or wasn't it? From my readings over the years, I always had the impression that during the Civil War, music just sort of stopped in Salem because so many of the musicians were away. Both Harry Hall and B.J. Fole alluded to this strongly in their writings. You know, Mr. B.J. wrote the book on the Salem Band, and then Harry Hall did Johnny Redbed from Salem, plus a phenomenal dissertation um, back in 1960. Um, but then I started thinking to myself, you know, that really doesn't make sense. Uh, if music was so important to the residents of Salem, how could it just stop? Um, although I came on the music scene a hundred plus years post-war, <laughs> from my experience as a musician, um, particularly a Moravian church musician, of which I am very proud to be, by the way, I've discovered that I don't choose to do music, but rather I cannot not do music. Does that make any sense? I think most of you agree to that. Once I realized this, I realized that my predecessors probably felt the same way, but maybe even more so because they didn't have all the distractions that we're inundated with today. So this was their, their one big outlet. So I decided to see if I could find out what was really happening with the music in Salem during the war. I had to pull together information from various types of sources since uh, very little was recorded concerning music in and of itself. Uh, this lack of recorded information wasn't unique to music for other organizations from that period show limited records as well. Uh, for example, um, Martha, you'll be familiar with this, uh, Brad Rauschenberg in his history of the Wachovia Historical Society noted the lack of documented details during the war concerning the Young Men's Museum Society, uh, which was a well-established offshoot of the Young Men's Missionary Society. Uh, what they did was collect artifacts from the different missionaries around the world and put them on display for people to see. Well, a post-war annual report of this organization noted the disorganization of the society during the final years of the war, stating nothing of importance had really happened, but that the society offers met, officers met annually, as usual, transacted any business, as much or as little as it was, and then re-elected themselves for another year. <laughs> uh, obviously, the majority of the members had their attention focused elsewhere during these years. So as I began my research, I thought I'd better check to see what was really happening. Before the war, um, specifically in the church, the community, and the girls' boarding school. Well, I was a little surprised at what I found. No, I was really a lot surprised at what I found. Uh, music was hot in Salem, as I always thought, but not in the areas that I had thought. I don't want to bombard you with uh, too much background on this, so I'll just say that the community music in Salem witnessed its greatest change and growth as a result of the invention and refinement of valves. Sorry, Eric. 
It's believed that the first true valve instruments in Salem were sax horns uh, acquired sometimes around 1850. Uh, these acquisitions opened up a new world for the instrumentalist, which when combined with the increasing secular influences and popularity of the popular music of the day led to a boom in brass bands. Uh, references to the Salem Brass Band uh, began appearing in documents by 1851, and this continued to grow in quality and popularity over the next 10 years. This was not the only community music in town, however. During the same decade, hey Barbara, y'all come on in. During the same decade, the Classical Music Society was formed under the leadership of the Reverends F.F. F. Hagen and Maximilian E. Grunert and uh, Professor Edward W. Leinbach, instructor of music at the Salem Female Academy. Uh, interestingly, Hagen and Leinbach were two of the last of the early, or what we consider the early American Moravian composers. The purpose of this organization, that being the Classical Music Society, was to provide an outlet for the rendering of oratorios and other church works with orchestral accompaniment. Thus, there was still a desire for what you might call higher quality music in addition to the popular music of the brass band. This desire was strong enough that the Music Society and the Young Men's Missionary Society decided to jointly construct a building that would have room for their meetings, it would have room for a small museum, and a new performance hall. In response to an inquiry made by the, now this is the brass band, to the Alfsera Collegium, or the trustees, to return money the band had donated for the old music hall so they could recontribute it to the construction of the new one because they knew they'd get to use it also. Um, the minutes from the April 13th, 1857 Collegium um, meeting read, this right the committee cannot understand, but to extinguish it if just. But more particularly in consideration of the gratuitous services rendered by the museums of the town in church music, and for the encouragement of the brethren and sisters to perfect themselves in the science and art of music, so as to be able to serve the congregation efficiently and acceptably in the performance of church music, Therefore, resolve that the diaconate grant them $100 towards the erection of the contemplated music saloon. <laughs> I don't know how they get that from a performance hall, but anyway. From this entry, it seems the church really did want their church musicians to have training, even though their service was gratuitous, and I assume that means volunteer. By supporting the Classical Music Society, they would, in a roundabout way, contribute to the quality of the musicians serving the church and hopefully expand the pool of musicians available for service to the church. Now, I had always assumed that music in the church was thriving in the 19th century, but this is where I was badly mistaken. By the 1850s, there were only two organists available for service to the church, Joshua Bonner and Edward Leinbach. And with Bonner's resignation as organist in the late 1850s, the boards decided that maybe they should start paying for this position. <laughs> and maybe get that person to start a class of aspiring organi organist, vocalist, and other instrumentalist also. Of course, being nice, they first asked Bonner, who said, no, nah, I don't think so. And so they then asked Leinbach. He agreed to take this on in return for a salary of $100 per year, per year for being an organist, and then an additional $100 per year for music instruction. So at the outbreak of the war in 1861, music in Salem was in transition. Church music was in the process of renewal, as in the organist is now being paid and they're teaching future musicians instead of just trying to rely on whoever's there. And uh, community music options were expanding, most noticeably the growth of the band and the formation of the Classical Music Society. How was all of this affected, or at least interrupted, with so many musicians joining the war effort? 
Although the first of Salem's musicians enlisted in late May 1861, less than two months after the war began, the second major musical enlistment didn't occur until nine months later. Thus, it can be assumed that for much of the first year, little changed in the way of traditions involving the instrumentalist, since there are still a lot of them at home doing their stuff. 1862 was a different story, however, beginning with the enlistment of those musicians joining up with the 26th North Carolina Regiment. Few instrumentalists remained in Salem at this point, uh, most likely those too old or young to serve. Um, church traditions continued, albeit on a somewhat limited basis. For example, uh, refreshments were emitted from Luffy's because of the high price of coffee and sugar. Uh, some choir festivals were not celebrated, as in single men, since there were no single men around. And occasionally, music was omitted from the funeral services. Uh, concerning funerals, the elders resolved in 1862 that, on funeral occasions, the singing of a verse before the church will necessarily be omitted in future unless the singing is supported by a brass band. A quasi-musical schism occurred in 1863 when Leinbach resigned as organist. Actually, it was more like sort of a soap opera, but I'm not going to get into all that. The boards discussed this issue thinking that Bonner would not agree to take on the organist duties again and that they would probably not be able to convince Leinbach to stay on. At a later meeting, they discussed their options for filling this now vacant position. Either ask Bonner and Lombard to maybe share the duties, you know, that way they wouldn't be tied up all the time, or they could call on the single sisters to help with the organ duties. Both men declined when they were approached with this proposal, but the boards held out hope that they could still negotiate a salary with Leinbach and then reappoint him to the position. His salary ultimatum was $300. That was triple his current salary. And again, of course, we know with the expense of everything, you know, it seems like, you know, well, you know, this was still getting him what he was probably getting before the war, but because of everything, they didn't have it either, so. Um, but anyway, the trustees rejected this, thinking this amount too much in proportion to the amount of services required of an organist, at least at that time. So early 1864 saw some of the services held without an organist. There weren't many, but there were some. The trustees once again visited the notion of training several of the single sisters with decided musical talents and who are already skillful performers on the piano. Margaret, had you been living then, you would probably have been approached. <laughs> but anyway, they were going to approach them to attend the organ after receiving the necessary instruction. And all of you keyboard players know that piano and organ are two entirely different animals. Although the names of these single sisters were not recorded, they apparently were recruited and trained. How do we know? Well, we know the men were not doing it, or there would have been some mention in the board minutes, the diary, or in the cash book. But someone was doing it. Click. <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's not very clear. Uh, the Salem Diaconate cash book corroborates this assumption in that at least three different individuals were paid for tending the bellows from late 1862 through September 1865 and it was continual, it was not with breaks in service. With the wartime economy, it seems highly unlikely that a bellows tender would have been paid had his services not been needed. Even though the community's economic woes increased as the war progressed, money continued to be spent to support Salem's music. Music paper, I have never in my life seen so much music paper that was being paid for by the different groups, piano strings or wires, hymnals, and, click, the musician's breakfast at Easter. It's assumed this breakfast, as you can see, was for the Easter morning instrumentalist, a tradition that continues today. Again, we don't know who these musicians were, but from the slide, we can see that it cost $5 to feed 10 people breakfast on Easter morning. 
Probably more than likely. And as you go on through the next couple of years, there were fewer people, but breakfast cost more. So it's just things just really got out of sight with the price. I mean, that sounds good now, but back then I assure you that was a lot of money. Evidence suggests that the music in the Salem Female Academy was not affected to any large degree during the war. Click. Now you can do it, David. Ow. The Academy was able to retain its full-time male professor of music, that being Langbach, although he didn't look like that when he taught. He was much younger. And at least three women music instructors, although they may have taught additional subjects as well. These three women were the Von Fleck sisters. Louisa Cornelia, or Miss Lou, got a cat named Miss Lou, began as teacher of piano and guitar in 1851 and was reported to be a fine contralto in the church choir. Lizetta, or Lizette, and you will see it both ways and you will spell it numerous ways, so it's kind of hard to find her because of that. But Lizetta Marie was teacher of piano from 1852 to 1867 and a composer of both piano pieces and solo vocal works. No less than three of her 10 known compositions, I had to increase one, I went back and re-added. Um, 10 known compositions were published between 1861 and 1866. This was during the war she was having music published. Uh, another piece was published earlier in 1854. Again, each of the pieces that she published was for solo piano. All but one of her compositions are found in some form in the Music Foundation holdings, and there was one that you do not own. The youngest of the sisters, Amelia Adelaide, or Miss Amy, was known as the Piano Virtuoso of Salem. Her technique and ability to transpose difficult passages at sight were well known throughout the community. She too was a prolific composer with a known output of 12 pieces for piano or solo voice. We know three were published, but these were published after the war. So she was probably busy doing something else during the war. Two of her works, however, were arranged for band by Leinbach, or we assume, again, there's no really hard evidence of that that we've been able to find, but were arranged for band and sent to the 26th Regimental Band during the war, perhaps being among a limited number of contemporary selections by women composers that form part of the Civil War band repertoire. She also served as pianist for the church Sunday school for a large part of her adult life, and most likely would have been one of the single sisters the trustees had in mind for training in Oregon, which is maybe why her stuff was published later. Their reputation as music teachers was far-reaching. From the earliest printed academy catalogs, uh, music was listed as an extra branch of instruction, and then extra fees were assessed for those students wanting private instruction. Parents of students continued to pay this extra fee even during the war, although it was Confederate dollars, but you know, that's what they had. An examination of the Academy Day books shows separate line items for the salaries paid each of its male employees, and it would list them by name and show how much they were paid. While the teachers were simply lumped together under teacher salaries, that is, except for the fun flex, click, their uh, salary was listed separate from the other teachers, although they were listed together. As you can see from the salary line, they paid the misses, as in plural, von Flex, and they also paid for, from the stationary account for them copying music. So they copied a, a tremendous amount of music while they were here also, for themselves and the students. But they warranted their own line, so. With the male instrumentalist away and fewer regular community music events being held, the community flocked to the ones that were presented. In 1857, the Academy replaced their annual examinations with an annual musical entertainment. Click. And just notice the length of the program, although you can't really read it here. During the war years, these were the only regularly scheduled musical events consisting of songs, piano selections, recitations and cantatas, 
with only an occasional question and answer interlude thrown in. Click. Here's a close-up. You can see it a little better. Uh, these closing entertainments became the highlight of community music events during the war. Some of them lasted up to two hours, and, and they were packed. Other community events were held when circumstances allowed. Concerts to raise money for war uh, relief efforts began not long after the war began. Click. The bandsmen, who would soon form the 26th Regimental Band, assisted in this 1861 relief concert prior to the enlistment, supporting a magic show by Augustus Wright. Click. This is a little closer up so you can see it. Uh, and of course, we know that Reich uh, joined the band a short time after the, the first group enlisted, so he soon became a part of that group. When Salem's bands were home on furlough or other bands from the area were passing through, most noticeably, notably, I think, that the Salisbury Band, which was really a good band, concerts were given to entertain in addition to raising money for relief efforts. Sometimes the ladies of the community participated in these concerts and sometimes they presented their own concerts. This is a program from one such concert presented by the Young Ladies of Salem. If you go ahead and hit the next one, David. Uh, as you can see from this close-up, someone wrote in the names of the performers by their respective pieces. This is probably one of the few items documenting women performers from this period or knowing exactly who was doing what. We know the Von Vlecks were doing stuff, but this list other people as well. And although it's written to the side in pencil, it was by someone who was there. So it appears that, that while the men were away, the women continued to play and sing. Thus the question, music in Salem during the Civil War, was it or wasn't it? To summarize, any conclusions about the state of music in Salem during the war must be drawn from those few scattered events thought important enough to be recorded by the diarists and minute takers, reports from local newspapers, personal correspondence, and account books. Unfortunately, the period produced no documents specifically addressing the issue of music. So this is how I see it from everything that I found. Music in the church appears not to have been in such a great state prior to the war, so war disruptions were mainly in the personnel line, and that being the instrumentalists who were away. As the musicians became more focused on community music during the pre-war years, little time was left for additional musical endeavor, endeavors other than tradition maintenance or maintaining what they already had within the church. Fewer musicians were preparing themselves for church work, which is why we only had two organists available. Composition was minimal, and there appears to have been a lack of quality among those who were serving musically, as evidenced by the account by the trustees about the state of the music or the quality of music in the church when they were asking for money back to give to this. During the war, some of the traditions suffered, uh, like music at some of the funerals, but other than the issues of securing organists, little else seems to have changed. If anything, it probably got a boost when women were invited to participate as instrumentalists in the services. Again, and even more unfortunately, details of their service were not recorded. Music in the Salem Female Academy was flourishing before and during the war with a full-time music professor and no less than three women music instructors. I say that, again, we don't have a record of who may have been assisted in other things, but we do know right after the war, all of a sudden there appeared a lot of other women music instructors at the academy. Additional ones, not in place of. Students continued to pay extra for individual music instruction during the distressed war years, and the teachers apparently received extra compensation for this instruction, as evidenced by the separate line item for the Fun Flex. At least two of the women music instructors were composing quality music, some of which was published during the war. Other pieces were arranged for band and sent to Salem's bandsmen serving in the war. 
Only after the war did these ladies receive the overt respect they deserved from the community at large for their quality work as musicians, having contributed their talents to the school, the community, and the church. Community music seems to have suffered only on the band front, specifically from the lack of regular band concerts because the bandsmen were absent. Bands passing through town presented concerts, however, as did Salem's own bands when home on furlough. The closing entertainments of the Salem Female Academy were highlights of community music before, during, and after the war. Through these entertainments, the vocal and instrumental talents of the students were showcased, further reflecting the quality of the music instruction they were receiving at the academy. When opportunities arose, the local ladies from the community presented or participated in concerts for war relief efforts. Perhaps the, the formation of the Classical Music Society and the ensuing concerts before the war helped provide the impetus and confidence for the ladies to plan such performances during the war years. There is no question about the state of music in Salem after the war, as the band movement resumed with a vengeance the Old Classical Music Society morphed into the Salem Philharmonic Society, which continued to present large choral works with orchestral accompaniment. Church music revived, and perhaps most important, the accomplishments of women musicians in the community were openly recognized and recorded. Thus, it appears that although Salem lost many of its instrumental musicians during, for the duration of the war, musical events save regular band concerts and some church duties, continued as usual. While the war served as a blip on the band radar, it inadvertently provided a shot in the arm, sorry, this is my cliche sentence, for other musical areas, and provided for the recognition of the musically talented women of the community. Economic recovery is sometimes seen as a positive outcome of such conflicts. For Salem, however, the Civil War actually proved to be a catalyst whereby musical life was expanded and strengthened, thus securing its place of prominence in the Salem community, a prominence that has continued to the present. 